Hey everybody, it's Charlie Craven back with another fly for the Fly Tires Bench column in Fly Fisherman Magazine. This one's called the Swim Coach. It's a really cool new streamer that I came up with a couple years ago. I hope you enjoy it. It's in the October, November, December issue of the magazine, so check it out. There's a really cool story that goes along with the name. All right, to get started on this Swim Coach, we're going to start with the Daiichi 2461. This is a size 4 here in the vise. This is the rear hook, and I'm going to take some olive 6 unit unithread. And I'll start it just behind the eye here. But I only want to dress about the front third or fourth of the hook. So I'm going to make a short thread base here. And come forward again. So I want to cover this with a couple layers. I want to make a good solid foundation for the fly. So that nothing slides, slides back later. So I'm going to dress the front end of that shank. And then I'm going to make a dubbing ball. And for the dubbing ball I'm going to use gold ice dubbing. And the idea of this is this fly sort of uh, came from looking at steelhead flies, that uh, flies like the intruder, that use a, a dubbing ball to spread the fibers uh, in the collar to make it, make it a little bit taller so it doesn't collapse when you fish it or swing the fly. Um, and the idea of this dubbing ball is just to act as a prop for the flash tail and the, the collar that we're about to put on. So I want to twist that ice dubbing down good and tight and on the thread base, I don't want to come back here on the bare hook, I want to do this on top of the thread base, I'm going to build a ball of dubbing. And it doesn't need to be terribly big, but I do want an edge to it, a shoulder to it. And as I run out of dubbing, I can kind of sweep that fiber back and just end up with the ball there at the back of the front third. So for the tail on this fly, what I've got is ripple ice fiber and ripple ice fiber is a really cool material um, it's a relatively stiff flash um, but it's actually cut in a crinkle pattern so it's shaped that way its actual shape is crinkled and what I've done here is I've mixed uh, light olive gold and sand I believe is what this is uh, the, you know the color choices are up to you you can use whatever you like so I've taken about equal amounts of all three of those colors and I'm going to lay this in in front of the dubbing ball and fold those ends back and wrap over it right up to the front edge of that that dubbing. You can see that tail is pretty ragged back here at the end. Um, I don't want it square cut and I do use the full length. I just tied it in at the middle of its length. Um, for the larger size swim coach I use the full length. For the, the baby swim coach, uh, the smaller version which is tied on a 4 and a 6, I will come in and trim some of these a little bit shorter just to shorten the overall length of the fly. So once I've got that tail in and I'll usually wet that down just so it kind of stays out of my way. I'm going to start with the collar. And the collar on this fly is possum fur, dyed possum fur. And I'm going to start by making a dubbing loop. So I've got my dubbing whirl here. And I'm going to make a fairly long dubbing loop just for ease of use. I'll take a couple turns up here. And then I'm going to come around the loop to close it. And then I'll bump my thread forward a bit, about half the distance of, of what we've got left here on the front end of the hook. So I'm going to take one leg of this dubbing loop and put it back here in my material spring of my vise. And that'll hold that out of the way um, so that it doesn't twist up with my working thread while I, while I get the, the possum fur ready. So now I'm going to take some yellow possum. And again, you can mix and match these colors you know, to your own, own needs. But I'm going to cut a small clump of, all, or of yellow off the hide here. And you can see it's got some longer, stiffer guard hairs. I'll usually pull those out. And I'll just set that down on the tabletop. And then I'll come in with a bit of olive. And I believe this is actually light olive. And cut maybe just a slightly bigger clump of olive possum. This one doesn't have quite as many guard hairs in it, but you can see it's got some nice black tips. So I'm going to take and put this right under the yellow on my tabletop, and then I'll pick the whole shebang up between my fingertips, like so. So I've just got those pinched in my fingers. I've got yellow on top, olive on the bottom. I'll take my loop out of my spring, and I'm going to tuck these two pieces between, or tuck these, uh, this possum between the two strands of thread. 
like so. And you can see this butt end is a little long. So I'm going to pinch that loop closed and I'll just turn it over. And then with very sharp scissors, I'm going to come in and trim that off as close to the loop as I can. I don't want to be flush to it, but I want to trim most of the short side off. And I'll pinch the loop just below the fur and spin the whirl. And I'll just let that twist work up through my fingers until it starts to spin the fur into a rope. So now we've got a nice even dubbing loop. I'm going to take my dubbing brush now and just brush out any trapped fibers, sort of direct this all downward so that I've got a, a nice pretty loop. And I'm going to begin to wrap this just at the front edge of that tail. And as I wrap, I'll sort of wet my fingers and comb each fiber or each uh, each turn back like you would ha a hackle fiber collar, a soft hackle collar. You can see I've got a couple turns of yellow and I'll get a couple three turns of, of the olive here. Just combing back as I go, just clearing the way for the next next turn. And then I'll tie that loop off at the front. You can see how already that collar is really upright and creating a lot of volume on the hook. So I'll take my dubbing brush and again just free any trapped fibers all the way around. And the reason I use the dubbing brush rather than my fingers is I don't want to jam my finger into that hook point which absolutely will happen if you if you do it with your fingertips. And you can see we've got some some mess up here up front. I'll just sweep that back and make a couple turns over the front edge of that collar. Um, that's going to do two things. It's going to sweep those fibers back and it's going to create a little base for the the hackle, the uh, mallard feather that we're about to wrap. So now I'm going to come in with a mallard feather. And in the case of this olive one, I actually use two colors. I'm going to use a chartreuse mallard flank feather and an olive mallard flank feather. And what I want to do, I'll show you how I prep these, is I've got two feathers that are about matched in size. And I'm going to, just one at a time, take and create a separation point at the tip. And you can see I've prepped these feathers, so I stripped all the fluff off of the bottom. And I'll stroke those fibers down so I've got a separation point. And I'll do that to the other feather as well. Then I'll stack the two feathers so I've got a match set like so. The chartreuse on the inside and the olive on the outside. So I'm going to use this match set and I'm going to tie this in here at the front edge with the inside of the feather curve toward the hook. And I want to make sure that I anchor this down good and tight here. And then I can trim those tips out. When you're picking feathers for this, you want feathers that have a relatively narrow stem. And in the case of mallard feathers, that's easier said than done. Um, so I use the word relatively there. They're, the stem is always going to be thicker than a hackle feather, but we want something that's going to be a little bit thinner so it wraps a little bit more nicely. Now one trick that I have found is I want to trim these stems down fairly short before I grab them in my hackle pliers. And I'll pull those two feathers upright and come in with my hackle pliers and grab both stems and lift them up. Now I'm going to fold these feathers by pinching my fingers around the stem and stroking the fibers back to one side. And you don't have to be super adamant about this. You don't want these to lay down flat. You want these to, to sort of stand up a bit and create that outside exoskeleton, the big outside profile of the fly. So as I crease those back, I'm not going at it super hard, but I can use the edge of my scissor blade to kind of crease that stem a bit as well. And once I've got those swept back where I feel comfortable there, I only need a couple turns here. I'm going to begin to wrap this, and you can see how I'll hold these in place on the far side as I come around. You can see how nicely those will lay back. Don't try to pack these turns one on top of the other. Let them spread out a bit. And I'll come right up to the hook eye and hopefully end with bare stem just behind the eye. And I'll tie those stems off with a few turns. Push my thread out of the way and trim those stems out. Now I'm going to grab my dubbing brush again for the same reason and just sweep all those fibers back. You can see how you can kind of release them and how big an outside profile we get to this fly. I'll sweep that back and just build a smooth thread head here over the top. And 
Now we'll whip finish that thread. And the back end is done. Now typically when I sit down to tie a bundle of these, um, I'll do all the back ends first and then come through and, and attach them to the front hook. Um, so that's the step for the back end. And I usually do put a little bit of solar res on here um, just to lock that head down. So I'm going to take some solar res bone dry and coat that those thread wraps all the way around. And then I'll cook that with my UV lamp for a few seconds. So we've got a nice glossy head that won't come apart. And you can see when I shine that lamp on there how that chartreuse shows through. So there's our back end. So I'm going to take and set that aside for the moment. And then I'm going to pick up a Daiichi 2461 in size 2. And I'm going to put a 5 or 5.5 millimeter brass gold bead onto this hook. You want to put that hook on right now, but ahead of time. And I'll chuck him up in my vise. Um, so it's a pretty oversized brass bead. And you can certainly use tungsten here, but we've got room for lead wire on this fly. So I'm not going to go to the expense of using a tungsten bead. This bead is going to do sort of the same job that that dubbing ball did on the rear hook. This is going to help to spread the front collar. So um, this is not a bead head fly. It's going to, this bead's going to be mounted more toward the center. Um, so I'm just going to slide that bead up out of the way for the moment. And I'll start that same 6 out unit thread about halfway down the hook. And I want to dress, dress the shank all the way down to the bend with a nice smooth layer of thread. And I want to make sure I get all the way to the very back. And then I'll come forward again. And you can see I've butted all those thread wraps up so that they're smooth and tight together. I'm going to take a piece of Senyo trailer wire. Uh, this is the thin size, and this is gray, but the color really doesn't make any difference at all. Whatever you've got or whatever you can get will be fine. And I'm going to take and tie this piece of wire in just off center on the top of the hook, just to the far side. And I'm going to wrap tightly back over it, all the way back to the bend. You want to avoid that hook point right there. So I've got that piece of wire just hanging off the back. Now I'm going to take a 3D bead in olive. And these are from Hairline. I'll slide that down right up against the back end of the hook. And I'll take my rear hook and thread it onto the wire as well. Now I'm going to take the long end of the wire and push it back through the bead. And one of the questions I, I often get on articulated flies, and um, I've ne never really been a huge fan of wire, but I'm coming around to it, but is how to get this, this loop back here uh, perfectly vertical and how to get it set up just right. And the trick to that is how you twist this front end. Um, you can see if I, when I twist that, I can turn that loop. So I want to turn that loop until it's vertical, and I want that loop um, just a little bit bigger than the eye of the hook. Once I get it there, I'll hold it in place. You can see I'm holding it with my, my material hand, and I'll catch the back end here so that that loop is straight up and down. Now before I get too far along, I've got just a little bit more wire than I need up here. So I'm going to cut this in flush to where I started the wire, and then I'll come forward over those two strands just anchoring that down tightly. Now I don't I don't go to the trouble to double that over. I've never had this come out. Um, this is actually an incredibly secure connection. And we will end up putting some zappa gap on here. But I don't I don't go to the trouble to, to double that back. I just don't catch fish that big I guess, but um, I snag plenty of trees and I've never pulled the back hook off. Now another thing that you can do back here to, to align this this loop is pull back and put your scissor blades in the loop and then open them up and that'll create a little bit of a corner there so it sets that eye straight up and down so that your back hooks always stays true. Now one little trick that I've come up with or I, I don't know about come up with but anyway a, a way to keep this back hook from stabbing me is I'm going to take a rubber band and I'm going to put it over the back edge of my vise 
and loop it up over the bend of this hook and that just holds that hook bend out of my way so it doesn't stab me in the hand every chance it gets uh, which it will do and I'll run my thread back to the bend here now at this point is a good spot to um, typically I'll stop here I'll, I'll whip finish the thread and apply some zappy gap and just let the whole dozen dry uh, so we're going to have a little bit of wait time here. I'm going to try to put a light coat, but a light coat of Zappy Gap down those thread wraps. And we'll let that dry for a bit. Okay, once that Zappy Gap is dried up a bit, we're ready to apply the second collar. And you'll see as I continue on with this fly, a lot of these steps are, are just redundant from what we did on the back hook now. Uh, we're trying to build that large outside profile and so we're going to put another collar in here at the bend so I've got two more mallard flank feathers and I've got them separated and stacked and these don't need to be quite as long so I'm going to strip a few of the fibers off the, the butt end of this and again I'll tie these in right at the bend by their tip end and I want to anchor them down tightly. And I'll trim those tips out. I'll shorten those butt ends up a bit. And grab my hackle pliers here. And lift those feathers the, the same way we did with the, the first two. I do want to make sure that there's no slack between the fibers or between the feathers so that I've got a tight fit. And I'll stroke those to the rear of the hook. You can see I can just kind of work those fibers up and down a bit. I want to be particularly sure that I get these ones at the bottom. Sometimes wetting your fingers helps a bit. So I'm going to start that first turn. And sometimes this collar might look a little ratty. We'll see how this one comes out. But it's easy to fix after the fact. We're just trying to cover the joint between the two hooks and you can see how I can use my scissor tips to sort of sweep those fibers around and let them get laying where they need to lay so it's just a couple turns and then again I'll tie off over the bare stem the reason I trim the butt ends of the feathers these here short um, is you can see if they were long as I'd go to tie off I'd have to sneak way underneath them um, that's just a pro tip tip after doing a couple hundred of these that you don't have to fight with so much so I'll trim those butt ends out, and again, just get my dubbing brush. That one wrapped really nicely. Everything's kind of cut to the rear. You can see it just envelops over the front half of the rear hook. So that came out nicely for me. It doesn't always come out that way, but I'm pretty happy there. And now I'm going to leave my thread hanging at the bend, and I'm going to take some 25 thousandths lead wire. You can use 20 or 25, depending on how heavy you want to fly. And I'm going to start this just in front of this little lump where we tied off the mallard. I'm going to make about 13 to 15 turns. 8, 9, 10. So we've got about 15 on there, and you can see how those come down in size as I come off the end of that wire base. Uh, I'll throw one more in there, and then I'll break that wire off at the front, and I'll just fingernail it here at the back. Now, before I slide the bead back, I want to crosshatch that that lead a bit with the thread and you don't have to cover it by any stretch but I'm just anchoring it down it's not going to go anywhere and I'll shove the bead back over the front edge you can see how that descending front edge sort of ends up being hidden inside the bead and you can see we've only got again about a third of the shank here in front of the bead and I'll just hold that bead back and jump the thread over it to the front and while I'm here I'll make a thread base all the way to the eye and then back again and then jump the thread back over the bead to that back side. So we've just locked that bead in place. Um, again, this is just like on my Dirty Hippie, the same sort of idea, but uh, people always ask me about that one span of thread there that if it ever got broke. Um, I'm not sure that I've ever seen it break, uh, but even if it did, once this fly's all done, everything's locked down on either end, so it's really not a worry. So from here, I'm going to take a bit of that same gold eye stub we used for the dubbing ball earlier, and I'm going to build kind of a shaggy body here. So I'm just going to start this dubbing, just get it pinched on. 
and I'm going to use direct dubbing to twist this down onto the thread. You can see as I'm working this clump of dubbing around the, the hook, it twists around the thread and I end up with a, a pretty nice shaggy body. And then I'll jump the thread over the bead again, kind of pick up any loose ends. Um, you don't really need to do anything to that dubbing. It comes out pretty shaggy, but I do like to clean it up a little bit just so it's not in my way. Dubbing brush is a pretty handy tool for a lot of my time. I use use it on almost everything it seems. So now we're going to build our next collar. Um, so this first collar is going to be some yellow rabbit. I'm sorry, yellow possum. So I'm going to build a dubbing loop here and clip that in my loop and then I'll take a nice clump of yellow possum pull those long guard hairs out so I've just cut it off the hide you can see I just pinch it between my fingertips and set it in the in the loop and again I want to trim those butt ends as close as I can you'll, you'll find out quickly if your scissors are sharp or not uh, odds are you need a new pair of scissors almost everybody does so I'll spin that up and, and brush that out a bit and I'm going to wrap this on this front end just in front of this bead three or four turns there and then we'll tie that off. Brush that all out. Make sure I've got that big wide collar. Um, particularly with this hard hard bead in here you can see how that really stands that collar up. That's building outside profile without having to build volume all the way through. I'll sweep that back a bit and again just shove that right up against the front edge of that bead using short turns of thread so I can really pack it in there to make that collar a little bit more vertical. Now the wing is that same blend of three colors of uh, ripple ice fiber and I'm going to take this clump and tie it in at the center of its length maybe just slightly diagonal across the hook with three or four turns so it's slightly angled across the top then I'll take my near side or front end and pull it to my near side and catch it with a couple of turns so that I've got kind of a V shape across the top and that's going to distribute that flash. That flash is pretty ragged it's not all the same length um, it actually works really nicely into a fly like this because it's not uh, not all the same. So once I've got the wing in place we're going to grab another pair of mallard feathers and you can see if you've got these prepped, this, this fly actually goes fairly quickly. It's not that it's not involved, but uh, a little prep time on the materials makes a, makes a huge difference. So I'm going to tie that mallard in good and tight again. Trim those tips out. Grab my hackle pliers. Trim those butt ends off and I'll just fold these again. Same move and again don't get too carried away with the, the folding you don't want them swept perfectly straight back. Um, I find if you fold them too neatly um, they'll lay down too flat against the side of the fly and they don't create the volume that we want. So I'll begin to wrap this feather just up to that bare stem, try not to catch my thread, and tie that off with a couple of turns. Now this one didn't wrap quite so smoothly which actually is sort of fortuitous for what we're doing here. I want to show you how to get around this. Um, those thick stems are sometimes hard to wrap um, so what you'll end up with is, is fibers going all kinds of different directions. So what I'll do is kind of sweep these back. You can see most of them are, are headed the right way. I'll sweep these back, slide my fingers in from the front, just take a couple turns over that thick stem to lay those back in place. 
so that I've got my collar in. And now we're going to build our head. And the head on this fly is just more olive possum. That yellow was just sort of a highlight underneath there. So I'm going to build a little bit longer dubbing loop just to give me a little working room. And I'm going to take a nice heavy clump of olive possum. Sometimes you need a longer bladed pair of scissors to, to get a, a big enough chunk of this. I'll pull those guard hairs out. They just sort of stick out at odd angles. It probably doesn't hurt the fly at all. It just irritates me. And I'll set those up between the between the threads and sort of square things up a bit. And on this last bunch, I'm not going to trim these quite as close. I'm going to let some of those butt ends kind of become part of the head. And the same move, I'm going to pinch that down and spin that up into a nice rope. I'll use my dubbing brush to sort of pick everything out there. And I'm going to start to build my collar. So I'm going to take one turn right over the base of those, that mallard feather. And the next turn almost overlaps. And then I'm just going to pack these as tightly together as I can up to the hook eye. And you can see I'll sort of brush back as I go. And I really do want to jam right up to the hook eye. Um, while this looks like a, a really bulky tie-off, if you get back down to the bare thread like we're about to do here, we've got just bare thread to tie off. So we can make a really clean, small thread head here without a lot of volume in it and trim that thread out. I'll sweep my fingers back to ke catch any loose fibers and just build a nice thread head over the top of that. Come in and whip finish right there. So I've got one crazy guard here in there. I'm going to get rid of him. And I'll use my dubbing brush to sort of sweep this collar back and by now you're getting a pretty good idea of the outside profile of this fly, how big this fly became without using a lot of materials. And that's, I think, one of the keys to design on, on any fly is um, how you can make it uh, bigger or smaller without uh, being quite so big or small. Um, and in the case of this fly, we're making a, a fly with a huge outside profile by standing those materials up more vertically on the hook. Uh, and that's what the, the spreader ball and the, the bead are for. So now I'm going to put the eyes on it. We're getting close to the end here. So I'm going to take some solar as uh, thin hard and a bodkin. And the trick to this is to sort of get a bead on the end of your bodkin. And I'll turn the fly sideways. And I'm going to put that bead right down on the fur just behind the eye. And you can see it'll kind of glob up into a ball. And then I'll do the same thing on my near side. Don't get carried away with it. It doesn't take a ton. And really this, this first little glob is just to sort of hold the eyes in place. So you can see I've just put a little glob on either side. And I've got some 3 holographic gold eyes. But again, whatever color you like. I'm going to take and press one eye in on the far side, just on top of that, that dot of resin. And I'm not really too worried about them being flush or flat or anything at this point. And I'll take my other eye and put them on top of the resin on this side. And then I can kind of hold them in place and get them evened up a bit. like so. And once I've got them where I want them, and I don't push them together flat, you can kind of see they're at an angle to each other. I don't want to push them together flat. I'm going to hold them in place and I'll hit it with the lamp and that'll cook that resin instantly so that those eyes are locked in place for the time being. They will come off if we don't co coat them further, um, but what I want to do is just get them pinned in. And you can see that the, the eyes are not 
pin pinched flat on either side of the head. Now this last piece, I'm going to take the rubber band off the back end here, and we're going to create the head. And to do that, I'm going to take the fly out of the vise. Uh, as many of you know, I tie right handed or tie left handed, but I am right handed, so I've got to get this positioned uh, where I can get a hold of it. And what I'll do first is any of these loose fibers up here coming between the eyes, I'll usually trim those out. Just makes the resin a little easier to apply, so I don't have to fight with those. And it's not a ton of trimming, it's just those little loose ends. And I'll grab a pretty good size glob of solar res here. And I'm going to come in and just go between the eyes here and sort of dab this down. I want to be careful not to get it in the hook eye, but I'll come up on either side of the, the actual eyes and draw that resin right up onto the eye. I'm going to come across the bottom, need a bit more here. It's one thing I've learned as I've done a bunch of these is it's better to do a little bit at a time rather than one big giant glob. It's harder to control. So I'm building a mask up onto the eye with the resin. And then I'll cook that. And then I'm going to come in with one more thin coat over the top. Just to smooth things off. This is totally unnecessary, but it just makes the fly pretty and clean. The fly would hold together just fine as it was. But I just want to smooth that off a bit. And that second coat doesn't soak in. It sits on top of the first coat, so um, it's a little easier to smooth. And then I'll cook him up a bit. Make sure everything's squared up, and we've got our finished head shape there. You can see that mask built in on the front end, and then I'll chuck it back up here in the vise so you can get a better look at him. And that is our finished swim coach. Um, I might go at him again with the, the dubbing brush. Um, you can see that big outside profile. Nice head shape, really great wiggle back here, but a really sparse fly. Not, uh, you know, compared to a lot of the other articulated stuff that I do and that's out there in the world these days, it's just there's not near as much material on it, which is uh, something I've come to appreciate. Flies that are tied sparsely and heavily uh, sink a lot better than flies that are tied heavily. Um, when there's a lot of material, it slows the sink rate. This fly's really got not that much material on it, um, but it does have a lot of surface area. Um, and I think the combination between the, the bulk on the front of the hook and the wire connection to the back hook, um, I really get a lot of swing on this tail, really a, a kind of a, a broken action to it, um, sort of like a Blaine Chocolate T-Bone. Um, that was not, not by design, but uh, as I uh, kind of look back at some of his stuff, that's exactly what, how it came out. So, um, you know, good ideas to transfer. Um, big stuff, small stuff, it's really the same idea. We're just trying to get a fly that uh, looks like something injured that can't get away and, and is an easy meal. So. There's my swim coach. Uh, this is the olive version. Uh, really, you can do it in any variety of colors. Mallard's really fun to work with and kind of layering the different colors gives you all sorts of options. Uh, brown and yellow, black and purple, uh, white, gray, uh, tan, tan and yellow. Um, all good color combinations. Really a fun fly to play with. This is something I've had a lot of fun with. I've caught a lot of fish on it. Um, you know, it's always fun coming up with something new. I'm pretty excited about this one. I hope you like it as much as I do. Give them a shot.